Good morning and welcome to our service and a very warm welcome to you wherever you are joining us from today. Today we have members of all three of our congregations here at St Bart's taking part in the service. Emma and Owen will be leading our music. Bev will be speaking to the children. The Dawes family will be leading our prayers, Jude reading our Bible passage, and Charlie will be preaching for us and helping us to see how it is relevant to our lives today. And we'll also be hearing from Lizzie Poole, one of our mission partners with Wycliffe Bible Translators, currently back in this country from Tanzania. And I pray that you will find our time together today to be uplifting and encouraging, nourishing to your soul as we raise our eyes to look on our God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is extraordinary to think how much things have changed in just the past couple of months, isn't it? And who knows where things are going to be in another few weeks time. But in the midst of so much change, Jesus has not changed and will not change. The Bible says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. This means so many things and is wonderful in so many ways. Most, most significantly, it means that the salvation he has won through his suffering will not change. Again, the Bible puts it like this. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The source of eternal salvation. A salvation that will never change based on the merits of a saviour who will never change. Jesus' perfect life and perfect death have secured for us a perfect salvation. I'm going to lead us in a prayer and then we'll respond to the good news of this salvation in thanks and praise as we sing together our opening hymn. Let's pray. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in your saving death for us and the unchanging salvation it has won for us. We praise you for the forgiveness and acceptance and peace with God, which the shedding of your blood on the cross have released to us. And we thank you that grace and love now pour incessantly, unchangingly, eternally on us like mighty rivers. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in you, we praise you, we thank you, we worship you today. Amen.
my glory, nothing in the world I see. You have cleansed and sanctified me. You yourself have set me free. Paul writes, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The salvation Jesus offers us teaches us to say no to ungodliness. If we would receive that salvation, these are the people we must seek his grace to help us to be. We're going to keep a moment of quiet to bring before God those ways in which we have said yes to ungodliness. As we prepare to seek his forgiveness and his grace to change. A moment of quiet. We say together, Our Father in heaven, we have sinned against you, we have disobeyed and ignored you. Please forgive us for the wrongs we have done, for being selfish and greedy, for bad temper and angry words, we are sorry, for hurting others for lies we have told, for the wrong in our hearts, we are sorry. For not trying to please you, for not helping others, we are sorry. Please forgive us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who died so that our wrongdoings might be forgiven. And help us to live lives which please you, and bring life to others. Amen. Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Lord Jesus, we thank you for redeeming us so that we might be forgiven. Please now, would you purify us, that we may be yours, eager to live lives that are good, so that you may be honoured in the world. Amen. And now, it's over to Bev. Well, hello there, boys and girls, uh, children and youth. Hello. Uh, knock, knock. Are you watching? Uh, give us a cheer from your home if you're watching. Um, I'm Bev. I'm the children's and youth worker at St Bart's, and I'm in the garden again. But this time I'm not doing DIY. I'm doing gardening, like you should do at the garden. And ga the garden is a great place to learn about how God deals with his world. You learn all kinds of lessons in the garden, you know. And so I've got my gardening gloves and my pruning shears or secateurs. Don't really know which one is it, it is. And I've got my watering can. Now, why am I down right here like this? Why am I bending down? Well, I want to show you something. I want to show you this plant here. This plant, you can't really tell at the moment, but it is a rose plant. A rose plant. Uh, but it hasn't got any flowers. Um, and do you know why? It's because I've been a bad gardener. I haven't been looking after it very well. Uh, because, do you know what? This plant is not one year old. It's not two years old. It's not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven, not eight, not nine. It is ten years old. And ten years ago, it was involved in another God's Word Says slot in St Bart's. Isn't that crazy? Well, 
I haven't really been looking after it for very good for a yeah. long maybe the first five years but I haven't really been looking after it very well and do you know how you look after plants like this this is what the gardeners tell me you have to prune it I know prune yeah you, <laughs> you could say that word with me pruning yes uh, and you know that's just a really fancy word for cutting it's cutting uh, and proper gardeners know where to cut and they know when to cut and when you cut these thing, flowers, the, when these, uh, these stems, you cut them back, what happens is that in a few weeks time, or maybe months, I don't know, uh, their nice roses appear. But they don't appear unless you cut them back. And when roses appear, this is what we call a fruitful, a fruitful plant. We look at a plant and go, oh, that's such a fruitful plant. You know, isn't that cool? But first, to get a fruitful plant, you have to prune yes and you know what god says uh in his word the bible this is what jesus said and he likened us to flowers so that what we do with flowers god does with us okay so jesus says i am the true vine and my father is the gardener see god is the best gardener he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit but well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that we, it will be even more fruitful. You see, God cares about us. God cares so much about us. You see, I don't really, I, I do care about that plant, but I haven't really been doing anything to it, really. And I should have been. But God is the best and he cares so much more about this plant. And he cares so much more about me and about every single one of you. And when you care about it, you look after it. And so God looks after us. And just like how, what we do with this plant, uh, God does with us. So, so he prunes us. He doesn't cut us. But he prunes us. And it means that uh, he changes us. And he disciplines us. So he tells us off. And he tries to help us get things right. And he stops us from thinking that we are the best. And that's what it means for us to be pruned. Okay? Uh, and so those who belong to Jesus, those who are in Christ, that's the fancy word for it, are looked after. And it means that when we are changed, when we are disciplined, uh, when God wants to change our sinful thinking then it means we are being pruned, but so that we can be even more fruitful. We can be even more beautiful uh, and get things right and please God all the more. And so, should we say this? This God's word says is from John chapter 15 and verses 1 and 2. It says, Jesus says... I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that he will be even more fruitful. John chapter 15, verse 2. Now we're going to sing a song and it's called Good and Gracious and this is how the actions go. It says, Good and Gracious, you're our creator. Good and Gracious, to all you've made, you're good and gracious. You never change. There's goodness in everything you do. And you've got to turn around like that. Let's sing with Owen.
requested that all international staff return to their home countries in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and in the light of increasing restrictions on international flights and countries closing their borders. Um, we can praise God that all staff who needed to leave did and everybody has arrived safely in their home countries. Since then our offices in Tanzania have also closed and staff are doing their best to work from home. Please do pray for colleagues in Tanzania that God will keep them and their families healthy. Um, information about the COVID-19 situation in Tanzania seems to be quite heavily censored, so it's difficult to know what's really happening. Um, it's also very easy for misinformation to spread, so please do pray um, that people would be able to discern truth from myth um, in relation to keeping themselves safe. There are th certainly things to praise God for, um, however, in, um, in the work that's going on in Tanzania. So do praise God that Mbugwe translators Shishi and Mufulu managed to complete their draft of Acts um, and have almost finished 1 Timothy as well in the last couple of weeks. Um, praise God that we managed to um, proofread the first half of Luke before leaving um, and that we are managing to carry on doing um, the second half slowly, piece by piece, um, despite being remote. Um, do also praise God um, that the Mbugwe Jesus film voice actor auditions um, were successful in February um, and that it was a great opportunity for the community to get excited together about the prospect of hearing Jesus speak Mbugwe. Um, please pray that their enthusiasm would not be dampened because of the need to delay the actual recording because of COVID-19. There are um, some other things to pray for as well. Please do pray for us as we adjust to remote working. Um, that's by no means a situation that's unique to Wycliffe. Um, people all over the world are having to adjust um, to working remotely. Um, there are some, some challenges in Tanzania that make it a little bit more difficult, however. Um, so please do pray for good internet connection. Um, it's generally much less reliable there than here. Um, and also some colleagues don't have access to electricity in their homes, so um, they are still having to go um, into the office um, to work. Um, please also pray for the Rangi team as they finish up checking the New Testament before it's published. Um, we also have some fairly big decisions to make in, with regards to the writing system, um, so please pray that the decisions we make there would um, help people understand and read God's word um, rather than hinder it um, and that God would use um, the Rangi New Testament to bring many people into his kingdom. Thank you. It was great hearing from Lizzie Paul, so let's pray for her now. Heavenly Father, thank you that your word is supremely valuable. Thank you for all those who work around the world translating the Bible. Thank you for the challenging but exciting work going on in Tanzania with numerous languages. Thank you for what Lizzie was able to achieve before having to leave the country. And thank you that because of the internet, She's still able to contribute so much. Over the last few days, we've remembered the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe. Lord, thank you for saving Europe from such a great enemy. The photos of victory celebrations are amazing, and there was such great happiness after a lengthy military struggle with immense national sacrifice. This example from the past strengthens us as we struggle with lockdown and the realities of the pandemic. Lord, keep us going and help us to trust in you. We look forward to a day when we can meet side by side with others to sing your praises. Thank you for those who are risking their health to serve us. 
We pray for those in our church, within Bath and across the globe, who are working in hospitals, doctor's surgeries and food shops, for delivery drivers, posties and so many others. Thank you for those who are serving their communities by volunteering their help. Lord, inspire us to continue caring for each other and those in our communities. And when we have chats, help us not to just talk about the weather, but more important things like life and eternal life. Lord God, please give our Prime Minister and Government and their advisers wisdom for the days ahead as they balance many factors, are in the media spotlight and have to take really hard decisions. May they know how to allow people back to work safely and the best time and way to reopen our schools. Today we want to be built up by God's word. Lord, thank you that today you invite us to be part of your great banquet. Believers gathered from every tribe and nation who know that they are forgiven and who are celebrating the victory of Jesus. Thank you that today, even as we watch this service through YouTube, you are wanting to feed us and speak to us warmly and personally to replace anxiety with deep confidence in you. Remind us, Lord, of how great you are and the ways of your kingdom. Remind us of Jesus, our rescuer, and fill us afresh with the power and life of your Holy Spirit. Let's join together, wherever we are, in saying this wonderful prayer of declaration, confession and victory. Our Father, Father in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come. Your, your will be done. Be done on earth, earth as in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, apologies for the cow that did a little moo in the background halfway through one of those prayers. Now let's get back to Emma and join together in singing How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
This morning's passage is taken from Luke chapter 14, verses 15 to 24. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I have just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, let's uh, pray before we look at God's word together. Lord, we ask uh, that you'd open up your word to us and that you would speak to each one of us today and we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. Well today we're thinking about the greatest invitation ever. What's the best invitation you've ever received? Uh, maybe some of us have been to a garden party at Buckingham Palace. Uh, in recent years we've uh, had uh, some royal weddings with only a privileged few. Uh, being invited. And all of this uh, reminds me of uh, Roald Dahl's famous novel uh, made into film uh, several times in which uh, everyone wants one of these, a golden ticket which will allow you to go to Willy Wonka's uh, chocolate factory. And there's that amazing moment where Charlie discovers a ticket What's the best invitation you've ever received? Well, Jesus uh, here uh, is speaking in the context of a high class meal. If you notice in verse one, he's at the house of a very important Pharisee. Uh, there are lots of other Pharisees and experts uh, in the law there. People are trying to get uh, the best seats. And Jesus has already been uh, teaching them. And at one point he mentions the resurrection of the righteous. And then in verse 15, we read, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And everyone knows what he's talking about. God's great banquet uh, described in Isaiah chapter 25, uh, where Isaiah looks ahead to the greatest feast ever. We read, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. Well, here we have the very best of foods, a real delight to be there, the best meal you could ever imagine. And it's for all peoples, a whole host of people there from all nations and backgrounds. And it's going to be a banquet of great triumph when death itself is finally destroyed. So we read here, on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And it will bring an end to sorrow and tears and shame. 
We read the sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want to be part of God's great banquet? And the assumption of the Pharisees at the meal is that they would be included among these blessed ones who are at this great feast. So who will be there? Well, Jesus then tells a story that's rather shocking about people invited to a great banquet. So verse 16, we read, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. Uh, Clearly the host, uh, the, the master of the banquet represents God himself and he invites many guests, an amazing invitation. And yet we see a first group who are invited, but in the end, turn it down. You see, it seems they've they've said they're coming, but after all the preparations and everything is ready, verse 17, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. Now's the time after all the waiting, it's now over. The day has come, come on in. And when the time comes, they refuse, they make excuses maybe it's like times where you've been invited you don't really want to go somewhere and you roll out uh, an excuse so here's the first one verse 18 Uh, i've just bought a field and i must go and see it please excuse me clearly this is you know wealthy person things are going well you know buying a field was a big deal a good business opportunity but the point is there's something more important work comes first And then verse 19, uh, the second person, he says, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me, like someone trying to test drive uh, their new car. But in this case, five yoke of oxen, that was uh, a huge amount. Normally, uh, anyone would have maybe one yoke or two yoke of oxen. But clearly, this is someone who's a, a landowner, someone doing really well, big business very impressive and uh, you know how often it is that those who seem to be doing well in this life have little time for Jesus and then uh, verse 20 the third person he says I've just got married so I can't come getting married is not a bad thing but here it means he turns down the invitation so these are people who have other things to focus on they're rich they've they've got bigger fish to fry they're busy they're distracted and they choose not to share in this great meal and if you look in verse 21 when the master hears their responses he's angry it's a great affront to him uh, for all these people to turn down his generous invitation basically they're saying we don't care about you and your meal. Other things are more important. And here, these wealthy people who reject the invitation, in this context, it it represents the religious leadership of Israel, those who you would think would be there at God's great banquet. But after all the centuries of waiting for the Messiah, when he finally comes, they turn him down. And you see, it's their uh, decision to refuse the invitation. And that means they don't come in. But just because they refuse, that won't stop uh, the banquet happening. And the host is determined to have people at his banquet. And so in verse 21, he tells his servant, go out quickly, no time to waste. Uh, Go out quickly into the, the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. I mean, this is very surprising, uh, a great banquet, and uh, inviting in these, these people that would you would never normally expect uh, to be at such a lavish banquet, and yet they're welcomed in. What an amazing host we have here, and here we see God's desire to, to gather in those who have nothing. It's a banquet for beggars, a feast, for the forgotten 
And next week, as we look at chapter 15, we'll see these are the ones gathering around Jesus. Uh, Disreputables like tax collectors and sinners, people who are spiritually bankrupt. And so the servant goes out and verse 22, he comes back and says, Sir, what you have ordered has been done. We've brought them all in. And yet there's still room. There's more space in the banquet. And then verse 23, the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in. Uh, These uh, country lanes, literally the hedges, and often there were hedges around vineyards to stop wild animals uh, getting at them. And it may be this is where, you know, beggars would lie down uh, to get some shade from the heat. Uh, Notice the servant is now being sent out beyond the city to those who don't even know the master. Uh, Very unusual. And he's to persuade them, to urge them, uh, come in. This feast is for you. Uh, You might not think you're invited, but you are. You're very, very welcome. And the master wants his house to be full. And we see again the generosity of the master, his desire to have a full house of people enjoying his banquet. And I think here this represents the good news of Jesus going out uh, beyond uh, Israel, tax collectors, sinners and prostitutes, uh, going beyond to the Gentile world, to those who've never heard about God at all. And it may be that it's the first you've heard of it, but you're invited and this meal is for you. But then in verse 24, the end, uh, we find Jesus warning. He says, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. If you reject the invitation, then no matter how important you may think you are, you're forfeiting your place at the great banquet. And how strange it is that those first invited refuse. And yet others who are called in at the last moment come in. And here's the point uh, for all of us today. God is inviting people to this great banquet. And it's such a generous invitation. And in Jesus coming, it's now decision time. He's the one who brings in and makes possible this lavish banquet. He makes it possible for disreputables like us to be welcomed in. For death to be destroyed and to bring an end to sorrow and tears and shame. And at the end of the Bible, this banquet is called the wedding feast of the Lamb, the feast of Jesus himself. And he is the one who invites us to this feast beyond this life, to eat and drink with him. Time of great satisfaction, of great joy, when all sorrows are gone and when death itself is swallowed up. And it's our response to Jesus now that decides whether or not we'll be there. So how will we respond? Will other things get in the way? Maybe things that in and of themselves are not bad, but things that can keep us from coming to the Lord. Maybe our career, our job, maybe our money and our possessions. Maybe, maybe your degree, your education, uh, maybe focusing entirely on marriage or family. It's so easy for these, these reasonable things to steal away our attention from God's great invitation. Uh, this invitation to enter God's kingdom and take our place at God's great banquet. And so for each of us, it's decision time. Will we accept the golden ticket that's offered to us? Don't miss out on this opportunity that's offered to you now in this life. Can we ever imagine what we would say to God if we we stand before him and he says, why didn't you accept my invitation? What are the things that are trying to steal away your attention from Jesus? Notice also how this invitation comes to people who are poor, people who realise they have nothing no righteousness to parade before God. People who realise actually we don't deserve to be there and yet because of all that Jesus has done for us we're graciously welcomed in like beggars to a banquet. 
have you responded to Jesus' invitation? Uh, if you have, that's wonderful to, to be able to look forward to that great time. But if not, what's holding you back? Don't miss out. Say yes today and accept this gracious invitation. Jesus has done everything necessary so that we can be there. But I think there's one more thing here in this parable. Notice also the servant who goes out. He goes out like a messenger to invite people in. And now it's us as believers who are to go out far and wide to extend this invitation to all people, to anyone who will receive it. Maybe, maybe to those who've got no idea about God, maybe who seem far away from him, who've never heard of his invitation. And to urge them and say, come to the banquet. You're invited. It's all been prepared. You don't have to be anyone to come in. But the master invites you to join him and be welcomed in to this great meal. It's the greatest invitation ever. Will you say, yes, I'll come? Well, I'm going to pray as we finish. Father, thank you for this amazing invitation that you offer to us in Jesus. Lord, please help us to say yes to you. And Lord, help those of us who know you to be ready to pass on this invitation to others. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
best invitation in the world is ours. An invitation to a banquet, to a life, to a home, before the throne, where God himself will wipe each tear-stained eye, as thirst and hunger and suffering die. Where God our King will reign, and we with him for evermore. Will we accept his invitation? And if we have accepted it, will we take it to others and offer it to them? A final prayer. Let's pray. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Lord God, give us grace to see that this is the best invitation in the world. Give us grace to put nothing before it, but simply to open our hearts and accept it. And give us grace to go out, even in these restricted days, to invite others to accept it too. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us this morning. We look forward to being together again uh, next Sunday at half past ten. In the meantime, do have a look at the Hope Initiative website where new resources, blogs and videos are being added each week and where there are conversations you can take part in and be part of on the forum page. If you can, do get in touch with someone today who might not be hearing from that many people at the moment. Ask them uh, how they found this morning's service. Why not uh, go for someone who you haven't spoken to yet during this time of lockdown? And may God bless you in the week that lies ahead.